king's son was going to be married. He had waited a whole year for his bride, and at last she had arrived. She was a Russian princess, and had driven all the way from Finland in a sledge drawn by six reindeer. The sledge was shaped like a great golden swan, and between the swan's wings lay the little princess herself. She was as pale as the snow palace in which she had always lived. So pale was she, that as she drove through the streets, all the people cried, she's like a white rose, and they threw down flowers on her from the balconies. At the gate of the castle, the prince was waiting to receive her. When he saw her, he sank upon one knee and kissed her hand. Your picture was beautiful, but you are more beautiful than your picture. And the little princess blushed. She was like a white rose before, said a young page to his neighbor. But she is like a red rose now. And the whole court was delighted. For the next three days, everyone went about saying, White rose, red rose, red rose, white rose. And the king gave orders that the page's salary was to be doubled. As he received no salary at all, this was not of much use to him, but it was considered a great honor and was duly published in the Court Gazette. When the three days were over, the marriage was celebrated. It was a magnificent ceremony. Then there was a state banquet, which lasted for five hours. The prince and princess sat at the top of the great hall and drank out of a cup of clear crystal. Only true lovers could drink out of this cup, for if false lips touched it, it grew gray and dull and cloudy. It is quite clear that they love each other. As clear as crystal. And the king doubled his salary a second time. What an honor! cried all the courtiers. After the banquet, there was to be a ball. The bride and bridegroom were to dance the rose dance together, and the king had promised to play the flute. He played very badly, but no one had ever dared tell him so because he was the king. Indeed, he knew only two airs and was never quite certain which one he was playing. But it made no matter, for whatever he did, everybody cried out, The last item on the program was a grand display of fireworks to be let off exactly at midnight. The little princess had never seen a firework in her life. What are fireworks like? She asked the prince one morning as she was walking on the terrace. They are like the aurora borealis, said the king, who always answered questions that were addressed to other people. Only much more natural. I prefer them to stars myself, as you always know when they're going to appear and they're they're as delightful as my own flute playing. What? What? At the end of the King's Garden, a great stand had been set up. And as soon as the royal pyrotechnist had put everything in its proper place, the fireworks began to talk to each other. The world is certainly very beautiful. Just look at those yellow tulips. Why, if they were real firecrackers, they could not be lovelier. I am very glad I have traveled. Travel improves the mind wonderfully and does away with all one's prejudices. The king's garden is not the world, you foolish squib, said a Roman candle. The world is an enormous place. It would take you three days to see it thoroughly. Any place you love is the world to you, exclaimed the pensive pinwheel, who prided herself on her broken heart. But love is not fashionable anymore. The poets have killed it. They wrote so much about it that nobody believed them, and I am not surprised. Romance is a thing of the past. Nonsense! A romance never dies. It is like the moon and lives forever. The bride and the bridegroom, for instance, love each other very dearly. I heard all about them this morning from a giant-sized sparkler. But the pinwheel shook her head and murmured, Romance! is a thing of the past. She was one of those people who think that if you say the same thing over and over a great many times, it becomes true in the end. Suddenly, a sharp, 
dry cough was heard. <coughs> and they all looked round. <coughs> it came from a tall, supercilious-looking rocket. It was tied to the end of a long stick. He always coughed before he made any observations, so as to attract attention. <coughs> <clears throat> Romance is a thing of the past. Order! Order! cried out a big firecracker. He was something of a politician and had always taken a prominent part in the local elections, so he knew the proper parliamentary expressions to use. A thing of the past. As soon as there was perfect silence, the rocket coughed a third time and began. He spoke with a very slow, distinct voice as if he were dictating his memoirs. In fact, he had a most distinguished manner. How fortunate it is for the king's son that he is to be married on the very day on which I am to be left for. Dear me, <laughs> I thought it was quite the other way and that we were to be let off in the prince's honor. It may be so with you. Indeed, I have no doubt that it is. But with me, it is different. I am a very remarkable rocket and come of remarkable parents. My mother was the most celebrated pinwheel of her day. When she made her great public appearance, she spun round 19 times before she went out. And each time that she did so, she threw into the air seven pink stars. She was three feet and a half in diameter and made of the very best gunpowder. My father was a rocket like myself and of French extraction. He flew so high that the people were afraid that he would never come down again. He did, though, for he was of a kindly disposition, and he made a most brilliant descent in a shower of golden rain. The newspapers wrote about his performance in very flattering terms. Indeed, the court gazette called him a triumph of pyrotechnic art. Pyrotechnic? Pyrotechnic, you mean? Said a Bengal light. I know it is pyrotechnic, but I saw it written on my own canister. Well, I said pyrotechnic. The Bengal light felt so crushed that he began at once to bully the little squib. I was saying, I was saying, what was I saying? You were talking about yourself. Of course. I knew I was discussing some interesting subject when I was so rudely interrupted. I hate rudeness and bad manners of every kind, for I am extremely sensitive. Why is a sensitive person a person who, because he has corns himself, always treads on other people's toes? <laughs> oh, pray, what are you laughing at? I am not laughing. I'm laughing because I am happy. <laughs> that is a very selfish reason. What right have you to be happy? You should be thinking about me. I am always thinking about myself, and I expect everybody else to do the same. That is what is called sympathy. It is a beautiful virtue, and I possess it in a high degree. Suppose, for instance, if anything happened to me tonight, what a misfortune that would be for everyone. Prince and princess would never be happy again. Their whole married life would be spoiled. And as for the king, <laughs> I know he would not get over it. Really, when I begin to reflect on the importance of my position, I, I am almost moved to tears. If you want to give pleasure to others, you had better keep yourself dry. Certainly. That is only common sense. Common sense, indeed. You forget that I am very uncommon and very remarkable. The only thing that sustains one through life is the consciousness of the immense inferiority of everybody else. And this is a feeling I have always cultivated. But none of you have any thoughts. Here you are, laughing and making merry, just as if a prince and princess had not just been married. Well, really, exclaimed a small fire balloon. Why not? It is a most joyful occasion. And when I soar up into the air, I intend to tell the stars all about it. Oh, ho, ho. you'll see them twinkle when I talk to them about the pretty bride. Oh, what a trivial view of life. But it is only what I expected. There is nothing in you. You are hollow and empty. 
stroke of midnight, everyone came out on the terrace, and the king sent for the royal pyrotechnist. Let the fireworks begin. Huh? Huh? And the royal pyrotechnist made a low bow and marched down to the end of the garden. He had six attendants with him, each of whom carried a lighted torch at the end of a long pole. It was certainly a magnificent display. balloon as he soared away, dropping tiny blue sparks. Everyone was a great success, except the remarkable rocket. He was so damped with crying that he could not go off at all. The best thing in him was the gunpowder, and that was so wet with tears that it was of no use. I suppose they are reserving me for some grand occasion. No doubt that is what it means. And he looked more supercilious than ever. All his poor relations, to whom he would never speak except with a sneer, shot up into the sky like wonderful golden flowers with blossoms of fire. Right, cried all the courtiers. And the little princess laughed with pleasure. Next day, the workmen came to put everything tidy. 
for this is evidently a deputation. I will receive them with becoming dignity. So he put his nose in the air and began to frown severely, as if he were thinking about some very important subject. But they took no notice of him at all. Till they were just going away, then one of them caught sight of him. Hello. What a bad rocket. And he threw him over the wall into the ditch. What, 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 what? Bad rocket? Bad rocket? He said as he whirled through the air. Impossible. Grand rocket. That is what the man said. Bad and grand sound very much the same. Indeed, they often are the same. And he fell into the mud. It is not comfortable here, but no doubt it is some fashionable watering place, and they have sent me away to recruit my health. My nerves are certainly very much shattered, and I require rest. Then a little frog with bright jeweled eyes and a green mottled coat swam up to him. A new arrival, I see. Well, after all, there is nothing like mud. Give me rainy weather and a ditch, and I am quite happy. Do you think it will be a wet afternoon? I hope so. But the sky is quite blue and cloudless. What a pity. <coughs> what a delightful voice you have. Really, it is quite like a crow candle. Croaking is, of course, the most musical sound in the world. You will hear our glee club this evening. We sit in the old duck pond, close by the farmer's house, and as soon as the moon rises, we begin. It is so entrancing that everybody lies awake to listen to us. It is most gratifying to find oneself so popular. <coughs> The rocket was very much annoyed that he could not get a word in. A delightful voice, certainly. I hope you will come over to the duck pond. I'm off to look for my daughters. I have six beautiful daughters, and I'm so afraid the pike may meet them. He's a perfect monster, and will have no hesitation in breakfasting of them. I've enjoyed our conversation very much, I assure you. Goodbye. Conversation, indeed. You have talked the whole time yourself. That is not conversation. Somebody must listen, and I like to do all the talking myself. It says time and prevents arguments. But I like arguments. I hope not. Arguments are extremely vulgar, for everybody in good society holds exactly the same opinions. Goodbye, second time. And the little frog swam away. You are a very irritating person and very ill-bred. There is no good talking to him, said a dragonfly who was sitting on the top of a large brown bulrush. No good at all, for he has gone away. Well, that is his loss, not mine. I am not going to stop talking to him, merely because he pays no attention. I like hearing myself talk. It is one of my greatest pleasures. I often have long conversations all by myself, and I am so clever that sometimes I don't understand a single word of what I am saying. Then you should certainly lecture on philosophy, said the dragonfly, and he spread a pair of lovely gauze wings and soared away into the sky. How very silly of him not to stay here. I'm sure he has not often got such a chance of improving his mind. However, I, I don't care a bit. Genius like mine is sure to be appreciated someday. And he sank down a little deeper into the mud. Quack! Quack! After some time, a large white duck swam up to him. She had yellow legs and webbed feet, and was considered a great beauty on account of her waddle. Quack, quack, quack. 
What a curious shape you are. May I ask, were you born like that, or is it the result of an accident? It is quite evident that you have always lived in the country. Otherwise, you would know who I am. However, I, I excuse your ignorance. It would be unfair to expect other people to be as remarkable as oneself. You will no doubt be surprised to hear that I can fly up into the sky and come down in a shower of golden rain. I don't think much of that, as I cannot see what use it is to anyone. Quack, quack, quack. Now, if you could plough the fields like the ox, or draw a cart like the horse, or look after the sheep like the collie dog, that would be something. My good creature, I see that you belong to the lower orders. I shall probably go back to court, for I know that I am destined to make a sensation in the world. I had thoughts of entering public life once myself. There are so many things that need reforming. Quack, 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 quack. I am made for public life, and so are all my relations, even the humblest of them. Whenever we appear, we excite great attention. I have not actually appeared myself, but when I do so, it will be a magnificent sight. As for domesticity, it ages one rapidly and distracts one's mind from higher fields. Oh, the higher things of life. How kind they are. That reminds me how hungry I feel. And she swam away down the stream saying, Quack, quack, quack. Quack, 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 quack. Quack, 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 quack. Quack, quack, quack. Come back. Uh, come back. I have quack, a great quack, deal quack. to say to you. But the duck paid no attention to him. I am glad that she has gone. She has a decidedly middle-class mind. And he sank a little deeper still into the mud and began to think about the loneliness of genius. When suddenly, two little boys came running down the bank with an old iron pot and some kindling wood. This must be the deputation, said the rocket, and he tried to look very dignified. Hello. Look at this old stick. I wonder how it came here. And he picked the rocket out of the ditch. Old stick? Impossible. Gold stick, that is what he says. Gold stick is very complimentary. In fact, he mistakes me for one of the court dignitaries. Let us put it into the fire. It will help to boil the water. So they piled the firewood together and put the rocket on top and lit the fire. Oh, this is magnificent. They are going to let me off in broad daylight so that everyone can see me. We will go to sleep now. And when we wake up, the water will be boiled. The rocket was very damp, so he took a long time to burn. At last, however, the fire caught him. I know I shall go much higher than the stars, much higher than the moon, much higher than the sun. In fact, I shall go so high that... And he went straight up into the air. Oh, delightful! <laughs> I shall go on like this forever! <laughs> what a success I am! But nobody saw him. Then he began to feel a curious tingling sensation all over. Now, now I'm going to explode. I shall set the whole world on fire and make such a noise that nobody will talk about anything else for a whole year. And he certainly did explode. But nobody heard him. Not even the two little boys. For they were sound asleep. I knew I should create a great sensation, gasped the rocket, and he went out.